also next to last section of our symposium. Uh, thank you for your understanding and flexibility as we navigate changes in our program. Um, it's my pleasure to lead the, this next to last part of the event. Um, the discussion so far have been extremely enlightening and I'm excited to continue the scholarly exploration in this session. Uh, so, to maintain the flow of our discussions, we will proceed with the next scheduled presentation, followed by a screening of the theatrical performance of the myth of Indirianka and closing remarks to conclude the today's event. But for now, it is with great pleasure that I have the honor of introducing our next distinguished speaker, who is from the University of Ljubljana, and is also the Associate Dean here at the Faculty of Arts next door. Actually, our colleague, Professor Matej Kribeshev, will be sharing insights on a topic that um, bridges the, the rich traditions of classical philology with the cutting-edge advancements in technology. The title of his presentation is Classical Language, Languages at the Crossroads of Tradition and Artificial Intelligence. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to our speaker. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. A warm welcome also from my part. Allow me first uh, all to express my sincere thanks to all the organizers of today's con conference, both, of, both for their efforts and for inviting me to speak at today's symposium. In my paper, I would like to outline what has happened in the field of classics over the last 50 years? What the development of computer science has contributed to the development of classics? And in the last part, my vision or expectation of what the development of artificial intelligence has brought us, at least in some areas, and what it might bring us in the future. This paper is primarily a reflection on these questions. Let me first explain why I have chosen this title. The idea is based on an ancient parable entitled Hercules at the Crossroads. The author of this now lost work was the sophist Prodicus of Chaos, and the story was preserved and handed down to us by the historian Xenophon in his Memorabilia, Memoirs of Socrates. In this parable, Socrates tells the story of the young Hercules, who is in solitude deciding which path to take him in his life. Two women approach him, one well-groomed, splendidly and expensively dressed, the other modest and plain. When he asks them their names, the first replies that her name is Happiness, although her opponents call her Vice, and the second that her name is Virtue. Let us end the story here. We will come back to it at the end. When I consider the problem of the relationship between the classical philology and modern technologies, I can look at it from five different angles – linguistic, literary, cultural, civilizational, didactic and general education. I would like to focus on the first two aspects that, that comes closest to the central theme of this symposium – the linguistic and the literary. In the last 70 years, classical philology has achieved several milestones in the field of linguistic research that have had a profound impact on research and have led to remarkable results. The first of these milestones was the decipherment of the linear B script in the years 1951-1953 which shifted our knowledge of the Greek language a good half millennium into the past. 
This was primarily the achievement of the architect and philologist Michael Ventris and the classical philologist John Chadwick, who drew on the work of the American philologists Alice Cooper and Emmett Leslie Bennett. The decipherment was a great success and the results were remarkable. The records, although they did not contain literary texts, but mainly lists and inventories for the needs of the civil service, trade, religion and the army. The decipherment of the Linear B script is the result of the classical philological method combined with the methods of military decipherment. However, there are already very sophistic, sophisticated tools on the internet that enable non, non even not uh, uh, that enable even non experts to gain a good insight into the inner B script. In the last 50 years, however, the development of information technology has brought many changes to philological work with digitization and the creation of the first computerized corpora and databases, corpora of ancient texts which used to take years to publish and cost a lot of money to acquire, have suddenly become more accessible. And the first step was taken in the field of Greek language and literature. The TLG project, Thesaurus Lingue Grece, a research program founded in 1972 at the University of California, Irvine, was launched. The initial focus of the project was on ancient Greek literature, but the project was later expanded to include Byzantine and modern Greek, and the size of the corpus tripled. Since then, the TLG has collected and digitized most literary texts in Greek from Homer to the fall of Byzantium in 1453. The project is currently led by director Maria Pantelia and the entire collection was put online in 2001. The main aim of the project is to create a comprehensive digital library of Greek literature from antiquity to present day. Fifteen years later, in 1987, a similar, although somewhat smaller, database for Latin language and literature was created, thanks to the Packard Humanities Institute, non-profit foundation established in 1987 and based in Los Altos, California which to this day funds projects across a broad spectrum of preservation issues in the fields of archaeology, music, film preservation, historical preservation and Greek epigraphy, with the goal of creating tools for basic research in humanities. And this database was supplemented in the early 90s by Biblioteca Togneriana. Latina, a project in which the texts of all critical editions of Latin writers published in the most renowned collection for, for the edition of ancient texts by the Teubner Publishing House in Leipzig were collected. After digitalization, the texts were published on CD-ROMs until 2006, and today the collection is owned by the Grutter Publishing House and is available online. The BTL online that database provides electronic access to all editions of Latin texts published in this collection from antiquity and late antiquity to medieval and neo-Latin texts. The next database, Library of Latin Texts, was launched in 1991. Today it is de developed and produced in Turnhout by the Center Traditio Literarum Occidentalium. In 2005, the Library of Latin Texts was put online on the Berepolis website where it is now part of a comprehensive group of databases for the study of Latin language. 
Repolis Latino. This network consists of full text da databases and the database of Latin dictionaries. In the current version, scholars can consult 11,765 works, including more than 5,800 5, diplomatic charters. Similarly, Oxford Scholarly Editions Online is provided by Oxford University Press. The collection provides full text access to, the, to over 1700 editions spanning more than 2000 years of history, with authoritative editorial notes displayed alongside the text and advanced searching within and between editions. It offers primary material from a wide range of subject areas, from philosophy, literature and theology, to economics, linguistics and medicine. The Lloyd Classical Library collection was founded in 1911 by James Webb with two goals. First, to make the work of classical authors available to as many readers as possible. And second, to offer the best of Anglo-American classical scholarship. Today, the collection is up-to-date and accessible online. It comprises more than 450 e-books representing the entire classical heritage. Among the dozens of projects, I would like to mention just one more. Musis de Oak. Musis de Oak. Musis de Oque, the research project, a digital archive of Latin poetry from the, from the beginnings to the Italian Renaissance, which was founded at the end of 2005, with the main aim of creating a unique database of Latin poetry, supported by a critical and exegetical electronic apparatus. At present, the most important collections of classical texts have been transferred to digital media, mostly online. It is a large collaborative project that has been developed over the years thanks to the contribution of dozens of Italian and foreign scholars. And is enriched by specialized query functions such as metrical analysis and study of the heritage of ancient poetry. Why all these projects are mentioned? <coughs> Quite simply because they have enabled a remarkable upswing in linguistic research by providing access to the original texts and thus fundamentally changing the way we work and as accelerating access to the data. I would like to leave out specific and partial linguistic research and mention at least two projects where the new technologies have enabled completion or at least rapid progress. progress. The first of these projects is Lexicon des Frühgriechischen Epos, Lexicon of Early Greek Epic, a dictionary of early Greek epic poetry published by Van der Hoek and Ruprecht in Göttingen. It deals with Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, as well as the other works of the poet, Hesiod and Homer hymns. It was started in 1944 by German classical philologist Bruno Snell as part of an overall project archive for Greek lexicography, Thesaurus Lingue Grece. The project almost came to a standstill in the mid of 70s, but was then restarted and completed in October 2009. And the second one is Thesaurus Lingue Latina, which dates back to 1894. It is an as yet unfinished monolingual dictionary of the Latin language, covering the whole of Latinity from its beginnings up to Isidore of Seville. That means up to around 60, uh, 600 AD. 
it is intended to serve as a solid foundation for the study of Latin language and literature. It is still the largest and most comprehensive dictionary project ever undertaken. When the 100th anniversary of the publication of the first volume of the dictionary was celebrated in 2000, it was predicted that despite the innovations and advantages made possible by new technologies and databases, the work would take another 50 years or so to complete. <coughs> Technological developments also have also enabled remarkable progress in the field of papyrology. A good example of this is the study of the church scrolls from the library of Villa dei Papiri in Herculaneum, where advanced technologies such as depth scanning, X-ray depth ma ma mapping, laser scanning and the like made possible, possible by advances in computer science can be used to read the text fragments preserved on these scrolls and reconstruct at least part of them with the help of computer <coughs> processing. The technology also allows us to analyze, compare, edit and process text more precisely. The same applies to the field of epigraphy. Large collections or its inscriptions dating back to the 19th century such as Corpus Inscriptionum Grecarum and Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum are now available online and continue to be regularly supplemented by new finds. The last decades have been characterized by the creation of smaller supplementary or special collections mainly dedicated to more specific research in the field of language, especially dialects and history. This is the aim of projects such as, for example, Ricerche Epigrafiche in Sicilia e Magna Grecia, which aims to collect Greek inscriptions in so-called Magna, Gre Magna, Grecia, Mag Magna Grecia, this is the southern Italy. With all that has been published in the field of classical philology and its, rela and its related disciplines, one might get the impression that the study of antiquity has already been exhausted, as if everything had already been researched. However, this is not the case. With all the research and scholarly output, there is one major problem facing most fields in scholarship today. The amount of what is being written and published is becoming unmanageable. It is very difficult, almost impossible, to keep up with the publications, projects, innovations and new technologies given the regular work and pace of life we otherwise face. The result is increasing specialization. The figure of the generalist, universal scholar who can be described as polyhistor, is increasingly being lost and re replaced by specialists in specific areas of or topics. In addition, the dissemination of results and the reaction of the specialists is also very rapid today because of World Wide Web. And what are the strengths and opportunities for the further research in classical philology? Let me introduce you this in 12 reasons. The first one, long tradition. The good thing about classical philology is that its two subjects, the two classical languages and the texts written in them, have a long tradition that ends neither for Greek nor for Latin with the end of antiquity, but continues in Christian literature, in Byzantine literature, in medieval literature, and modern literature. The second reason is the amount of surviving material. The amount of surviving Roman literature is quite manageable and it is relatively rare to find anything new. However, 
if we add all Christian literature, medieval Latin literature, and Latin literature of humanism and modern times, the volume it increases exponentially. In the field of language, we can observe the use of Latin over the time and examine how it has changed its various social genres, its influence on the formation of Romance languages and other European languages, its influence on the development of modern terminology, and much more. However, medieval and modern Latin literature as such still offers many research challenges that will continue to occupy generations of scholars in the future. The same and much more applies to the Greek language and Greek literature. The third reason is Accessibility. Increased accessibility. In my opinion, this is the most important element that the new technologies make possible today. Never in the history of work on both languages have resources and literature been so as easy accessible as they are today. And this will undoubtedly improve in the future. Fourth reason, new technologies and approaches. What the new technologies will bring are new approaches and possibilities for dealing with and editing texts. It is very likely that certain tools will become so powerful that they will facilitate work, suggest solutions or even write treatises and books. The philologist will have three tasks. He or she must, as the first, watch over the correctness of the working processes. The second, be able to make critical judgments and evaluations. And number three, react appropriately in case of anomalies or misuse. The fifth reason are the new findings. Let me il illustrate this with an example. As far as Hellenism is concerned, many of us have the idea that this is the period from the death of Alexander the Great to the death of Queen Cleopatra in, uh, in the year 30 BC. However, research shows that the influence of Hellenism in various, various areas extended centuries beyond this period and that it continued into the late Sassanid dynasty in terms of administrative structures, economic developments, money, and other areas. The sixth reason, the advantage of small number. Classical philology is not a mass study, but this has many advantages, such as greater cohesion between students, between teachers, teachers and students, more cooperation, often a more individual approach to teaching and more intensive study. The resulting competition is also more of an incentive than a hindrance. Dialogue. Classical philology is a constant dialogue and interaction with language, with literature, with culture, history, historical achievements, but also its dark chapters. And in this dialogue, which requires deep reflection, we learn that things are often not just black and white, but that their understanding must be based on knowledge and sound interpretation, which often leads to original results. Desire. This is the basis from which every philologist must start. And let me quote the renowned classical philologist Mary Bird here. There is only one good reason for learning Latin, and that is that you want to read what is written in that language. End of quotation. The same applies to Greek. Amazement and excitement. The philologist of the German school advocated the principle that the starting point of interest in every discipline is astonishment, wonder. And this 
in this day a reference to the Aristotle, who wrote in his Metaphysics, through wonder man began to philosophize both now and in the beginning. Modern philology finds this alone is not enough and therefore adds a new category. That what is important is not only amazement but also enthusiasm. The tenth reason is a clearer view of the past. Those who have mastered the classical language not only have insight into the basic historical data, but also into primary sources that give them a deeper insight into different epochs, people and groups, so they can form their own view of things and develop their criticism. And the next one, nothing in excess. What I mean here is to avoid what has often been a serious shortcoming in the history of the study and teaching of Latin and Greek, an excessive preoccupation with grammar and the neglect of other aspects of the study of antiquity. On the other hand, we must be careful because knowledge of the language is the primary goal and basis of teaching and learning of classical languages. And the last one, importance and emphasis on re relevance. The undeniable didactic value of the two classical languages has been confirmed time and again throughout history. And the last reason stems from a, sim from a simple observation made in recent years that interest in the study of these languages, while not masked, is constant, and that more and more people who do not aspire to a career in classical languages but see them as an advantage and added value, as we say, are choosing to learn, not necessarily study Latin and Greek. And secondly, that people from technical uh, or natural sciences are choosing to study them because of because of advantages they bring together. To conclude these considerations, like most, but all disciplines, classical philology is faced with the question of how to deal with the use of new technologies, especially those as complex as the tools of artificial intelligence. It is undoubtedly right that we as a profession should be open to them, but at the same time, we must also be critical. The development of philological disciplines has a natural course, and in the 21st century, the integration of new technologies and their use will be part of it. And to conclude my paper, I will go back to the beginning, to the story of Hercules. Hercules, who is torn between the path of virtue and the path of happiness or vice, chooses the path of virtue at the end of the story, which demands great effort for him, but also rewards him accordingly. And just as Hercules is torn between the, between the decisions in this, in this fictional story, today, when we have long since arrived in the age of artificial intelligence, not only classical philology, but also other humanities, social and natural sciences, as well as technical disciplines, are at a crossroads. And the greatest danger I see here is the risk that new generations of researchers and students will rely too much on the new technologies and, above all, on the results they offer. But the difference between us and Hercules is that at this crossroads we cannot take only one path, we must take both. Why? As I said, the age of artificial intelligence has dawned. The tools are becoming ever more powerful and sophisticated. And it would be nonsense to ignore the many benefits that they their use can bring at all levels, levels of engagement with language. 
On the other hand, the classical approaches to language learning, study and research must be maintained, which are, st are still based on acquired cognitive skills, on memorization, on proven research methods and above all, on the principle of academic correctness, respect for authorship and recognition of scholarly of achievement by those responsible for them. These tried and test tested approaches, which are based on a centuries long tradition of dealing with, uh, with ancient languages, their literature and cultures in the broadest sense of the word, are, in my opinion, a guarantee of quality and correctness and a safeguard against misuse and falsification of the facts. All the changes we are experiences, which entail many changes to previous work and approaches, must be observed and responded to immediately. Two things are necessary for an accurate understanding of ancient languages and texts. A complex and throughout mastery of language at all levels and in all shades. And knowledge of the literature and cultural civilizational context in which these texts were created and in which these languages were used. Artificial intelligence and various software tools do not have such complexity, even if they are tools and technologies that learn and upgrade on their own. At the point we are currently at, the programs that currently exist can be very useful tools that can often make our work easier. I dare not make any predictions about the direction in which development, development will go and how powerful the new technologies will be. However, we must not overlook the most important aspect of the whole matter, the human factor, the people who are interested in this area and want to work in it. Our task here is to do everything in our power to ensure that both ourselves and those who will work in this field after us are equipped with basic knowledge and specific skills that will enable them to meet the challenges that new technologies and artificial intelligence will bring. Thank you very much.